DocuPod, the stories behind documentaries. The minute I arrived in Mexico, I would be off to the markets looking at things. I'm never satisfied with what I do, ever, all my life. I caught. I think she's a legend. Many Mexicans are admitting that Diana knows more than they do about their food. The people are going to talk a lot of silly nonsense about Mexican food. Of course, I'm going to correct them. These chefs are in such a key position. They're the stars of today, and they can influence people. Where are you all? This is my boot camp. It's my thing. We're just trying to keep up with you, Diana. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to DocuPod. I am Tiffany, and I am joined by the director and producer of Nothing Fancy, Diana Kennedy, and the founder of Honeywater Films, Elizabeth Carroll is here. How are you doing? Hi, I'm great. How are you? I'm great. I'm so excited to talk about this film. I had the pleasure of seeing it at San Francisco International Film Festival, and it's just a delight, and I want everybody to come and see it, and I can't wait to talk about it. So thank you for joining me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Of course. We got to get started with the origin story. I, of course, had the pleasure of hearing it at SF Film. And honestly, so far, it's my favorite origin story. I want you to please share it with the people. It's crazy because I've told this story so many times over the course of the last five years. And it never gets old because it was just really bizarre. It's it was so good. It was serendipity for sure. So I was living in Austin, Texas in 2013, and I knew that I wanted to do a project about women in Mexico, basically looking at the fact that, you know, women are responsible for the continuation of food culture around the world. And I knew that Mexico certainly had a really strong representation of that sort of thing. I felt really compelled to go to Mexico, and I was fascinated by Mexico. And so I started looking at women that I might want to interview for that kind of project. You know, I was looking for Mexican women, mostly, entirely, actually. Mm -hmm. And I came across Diana Kennedy, and I I guess I maybe heard of her in the past, but I, I didn't really know who she was at that time, which was confusing to me because I had been really actively pursuing, you know, an education in food and people in the food world and past and present, things like that. So it confused me as to why I'd never heard of her officially. I was immediately kind of just really intrigued by her because she, at that time, she was 90 years old living in Mexico in the mountains of Michoacan. You know, sustainably, she was considered the world's academic expert on Mexican cuisine. And I was just like, whoa, who is this woman? So I knew right away that I really wanted to talk to her and meet her and possibly have her be part of this larger project that I had in mind. You know, I was like, okay, well, how do I find her? I don't know how to find her. So I, you know, I was looking for an email address or a contact, but I couldn't really find one. And so I kind of just gave up, I guess, closed my computer, left the coffee shop that I'd been working in and went to this bookstore in downtown Austin called Book People. And I pulled into the parking lot. This is about an hour later, maybe not even an hour. I pull into the parking lot And I look up at the marquee and it says, book signing with Diana Kennedy tomorrow. (laughs) (laughs) I remember looking at that and realizing I had kind of been depressed at that point in my life because I didn't feel like I was contributing, you know, any deeper part of myself to what I was doing. And I felt like I really wanted to reconnect. It was a very interesting way for the universe to confirm that I was on the right path, Mm -hmm. I guess you could say. Yeah, I saw that and I laughed out loud and I also kind of teared up and I was like, okay, all right, let's do this. So I went into the bookstore. I was like, you guys, like, is this really happening? Like, what? Like, what? And they were like, oh, you seem very enthusiastic. And then <laughs> they gave me an email to this publicist. They told me it was her publicist. And so I just spent the whole night writing this email to her, you know, requesting very tacitly if I could do this, you know, five minute interview with her for this broader project that I had in mind, you know, having no expectation of how that might result. So I didn't hear back that night. And then I went in the next day, you know, to the free public event. I walk in and I look to my right and she's walking in at the exact same moment as I was. And so I walked up to her and I said, hi, Diana, I'm Elizabeth. And she turns around, she looks at me and she goes, oh, yes, you are the woman who wants to make the film about me. (laughs) And I was like, what? And then, you know, of course, I just went with it. I was like, yep, that's me. Okay, here we go. Oh, my God. You know, like, that's definitely not what I had asked her. I had asked her if we could do a really short interview. But then when she upped the ante, I was like, wow, maybe what if she's actually open to that? 
So I'm freaking out. You know, I'm like, it was just like the biggest fake it till you make it experience of my entire life. Oh, I love it so much. How it went from five minutes to a whole feature film. It's, it's just beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, was man. Or I was waiting around for her until after the event was over and she said... <laughs> She was like, okay, you're still here. And I'm like, yep, still here. And she's like, all right, well, what do you want from me? And I was like, uh, well, um, I think that your voice needs to be heard, you know, by more people because you're very unique. You're very special and you have something to say. And these are things that people need to hear. And so she was like, mm, okay. And she liked that answer. And then she said, well, you know, somebody tried to do a documentary about me last year and they screwed me over. So I'm suing them. Jeez. And I was like, really? Okay. Uh, all right. I was like, well, you know, no pressure, like at all. We don't have to do this because I'm not really looking to get sued. And she was like, well, you know, my friends at the New York Times keep telling me I need somebody filming me all the time. Mm-hmm. I was like, okay, well, can I be that person? She was like, sure. Can you fund it? And I was like, yep definitely (laughs) all of it see you soon (laughs) even though i had absolutely no idea how i was going to do that her feistiness is everything which is seen all throughout the film and it makes you happy like all we can do (laughs) is strive to be in our 90s and have that type of feistiness like that's what i'm living for right now is like i want to be that oh man (laughs) totally i agree yeah i know and then you spoke about funding you had an incredible kickstarter campaign with over forty seven thousand dollars raised but we know it's not all glamorous and pretty what was the funding process like for this film Oh, my God. I I don't even really know where to start. It's been hard. It's been very hard. I didn't have any experience making films. This was my first film. So, you know, I had studied a little bit in college, but you don't study the funding part of it in college, at least not in my college. And so I didn't know what I was doing. And I was just kind of throwing things at the wall and being like, okay, well, I have this incredible subject who trusts me for some reason, and she's going to let me do this, which is amazing. So now I, I have to do everything I can. And I think it's interesting because if I had been independently wealthy or if someone had just given me all of the money up front, we wouldn't have ended up with the same film, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think it was pretty... It was actually pretty critical to the film for it to have taken five years. You know, filmmaking takes a while, especially documentary filmmaking takes a long time anyway. But in this context, it was sort of like we got to see her and track her through these different stages of her 90s. Basically, I met her when she was 90 and now she's 96. So we saw her through a couple of different phases and, and our my relationship with her changed too, you know, throughout the film and throughout all this time. And I think, you know, after the third year, the fourth year, things can get dicey in human relationships in any different context. But I think things were difficult at certain points with her. And then I think after time, like after probably, yeah, three and a half years, the fourth year, whatever, she saw that I was still doing this, you know, and that I was still... committed to seeing this through. And I think I even surprised myself in that, you know, like I've never been this committed to something in my life, like not even close, but I think it was sort of the knowledge that, well, first of all, this originated as sort of a miracle situation, you know, so there's always kind of this like divine element to it. But then at the same time, this person who has a finite existence as we all do, but she's much closer to the end of hers than we are. You know, and she lives this extraordinary, exceptional life. And she is trusting me to do this. So, you know, it wasn't about me. It was up to me in many ways. But I knew that I just had to do whatever was required to finish this. So on the funding tip, I mean, I think it was a lot of asking every person I ever encountered for five years, you know, if they knew someone who might want to fund it or if this person, that person. Basically, I've just talked about it like a broken record to everyone I've ever met mm-hmm. <laughs> since I started. So I think, you know, it's like one thing leads to another. I applied for some grants and didn't get any of them. And um, I mean, there were so many moments when I was just unbelievably defeated and disappointed, you know, and why doesn't anybody want to get behind this? You know, I realize it's not like a cash cow or anything for a potential investor, but at the same time, it's a special story that needed to be told. And so I finally found, you know, my people who believed in the film, believed in me telling the story and ultimately got behind it financially, which was great. 
<laughs> a little late, but really, really good. So I'm grateful for that. Yes, and that perseverance is everything. Goodness gracious. You even talked about at the screening how your life is now categorized as before Diana and after Diana, after meeting her and spending <laughs> time with her, and how that has made you evolve as a person. And I think that's super cool too because you think about how much time and just a labor of love making a documentary about a person is and such a dynamic person like Diana it definitely has to have some kind of effect on your life so I love that you mentioned that at the screening as well. Yeah I mean it's very true yeah I mean pretty much every fundamental lesson that I've learned thus far in my life happened while I was working on this film and not even always because of the film but yeah it's a massive sea change in me, my character, my growth, my understanding of the world. And yeah, Diana gave me so many gifts just by opening the door to her life. And one of my favorite scenes was her kind of remixing her guacamole recipe. The, (laughs) The editing goes back and forth from her on TV giving the guacamole recipe and her now kind of being a little more fierce, just kind of remixing that recipe. What was the setup for that? How do you set up a subject to do something like that? I didn't know at that time that we would be editing it that way. It kind of worked out perfectly because we got access to that television show that she'd filmed in 1992 after we had already shot the guacamole scene, the sort of contemporary guacamole scene. It's funny because when I first started filming with her, my personal style was basically just like, let's turn on the cameras and see what she does. Verite style. You know, I wasn't really directing her unless she was looking for direction. At that point, funny because I'd already been to Mexico at her house for one previous shoot prior to that. And so I knew that right away, I mean, the first time we got to her house, this scene isn't in the film, but she made us these tortas that were like gigantic. And this was all happening. We got there. She was making the sandwiches five minutes later. Yes. And she just jumped right into it. She was like, okay, here we go. You're going to turn on the cameras. I'm going to make the sandwiches. And I was like, whoa, okay, great. <laughs> um, so, you know, it was like she kind of right off the bat wanted to cook for us on camera. I think that that's what perhaps she feels most comfortable doing, you know, because that's her life. It's been her life. And so much of who she is is based on this instructional model of how to cook the food because she's the one who knows. So it was pretty natural that she was doing that at first. And I was very happy that she was willing to do it. And it's funny because she had this very sort of presentational style about it where she would be addressing the camera. This is how you do it. You know, and it made a lot more sense to me later once I saw the television show from 1992 where I was like, oh, she did this like for a full season. It made more sense as to why she wanted to, why that was sort of almost muscle memory for her. But with the guacamole scene, we basically set up a slider and I said, what do you want to make? And she was like, well, I guess I'll make guacamole. And I was like, okay, great. (laughs) Um, And so she did that. And then when we discovered the guacamole scene from the show in 92, we were like, oh, my God, it's exactly the same. Like, she says all of the same things. I mean, muscle memory, brain memory, like, she's just regurgitating exactly the same instructions as if they're, like, programmed into her mind like an encyclopedia. Except she's so amazing because even back then she had this sort of cheeky personality and now she's a little more, you know like growling at the camera. <laughs> but I th- I mean, it just worked out perfectly. We realized that there was a mirror image between the two of them. And so then we cut them together. It's incredible. Such good editing and just so cool to see how deep these recipes run within her and how they're literally muscle memory. And then we got to talk about screenings. Of course, all the screening information is going to be in the show description, but I will run through it for you guys. The Canadian premiere is starting on Friday, April 26th. It's going to be at Hot Dogs, showing three times at Hot Dogs, so make sure to check that out. And then a screening in L.A. at the Paley Center for Media in conjunction with the L.A. Times Food Bowl. That's going to be May 14th. And then there's upcoming screenings at Doc Aviv in Tel Aviv, the Sydney Film Festival, Moscow and so many more all that information will be at nothingfancydk.com so make sure to check that out in the show description anything else you want to tell the people Elizabeth? I'm just so excited that people are going to see who Diana Kennedy is because she really she had to get out there you know before it was all over 
she really deserves to be seen and heard for all of her complaints and everything, but she's the best. So I really appreciate you having me on. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you so much for telling her story, creating this film, and for sharing all these stories with us. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. And as always, thank you so much for checking out this episode. If you enjoyed it, make sure to hit that follow or subscribe button on whatever you're listening on. Once again, all the screenings and links are going to be in the show description. And then reach out to me. Let me know what your favorite part was or just say hi. I'm on Twitter at Special Says and on Instagram it's at Special Says as well.